From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Pegasus spyware reportedly hacked iPhones of U.S. State Department and diplomats. Burnout can lead to security threats, insider risk, and AWS as the Internet's biggest single point of failure. These are some of the stories that we have been bringing to you all this week on Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Paul Truitt, who is the principal over at Mazars. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And by the way, our sponsor today is Tynes. They are the no-code automation for security teams. I'm David Spark, stepping in for Rich Straffolino. And let's jump into this. You can join us, by the way, on LinkedIn Live. Go to CISOseries.com, the Week in Review page to find the link and join the conversation. We have just 20 minutes, so let's do it. Pegasus spyware reportedly hacked iPhones of U.S. State Department and diplomats. Apple reportedly notified several U.S. employee and State Department employees that their iPhones may have been targeted by an unknown assailant using state-sponsored spyware created by the controversial Israeli company NSO Group, according to multiple reports from Reuters and The Washington Post. This focuses on officials stationed in or focusing on Uganda using iPhones registered to their overseas phone numbers. Now, Paul, this NSO story just keeps on reappearing and now is affecting U.S. officials. Do you think this is the beginning of a trend, regardless whether NSO is directly responsible or worse, other groups having access to this technology? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I'm sure that we're seeing a trend related to this. It's very easy to use technology like this to gain access. I, I think I would voice that I'm more concerned about the fact that we have high, high level U.S. officials using, uh, you know, off the shelf devices like an iPhone for sensitive information or for using it for uh, reasons that really we could obtain sensitive data. Um, well, couldn't there be some, you know, like we see on a lot of phones in the, the idea of, um, you know, quarantining the sensitive information in its own bucket would, you know, stories like this, you know, if they had sort of their own quarantine area on their personal phone, this story not matter? Potentially. Um, I, I guess it really depends on what level of access they've obtained and how much they're able to get to, right? Are they able to breach the bucket, the the restricted zone on the device? Um, I, you know, I, I think I think we still have concerns around utilizing devices with sensitive information, even if they're quarantined. It really depends on the level of what that information is that we're putting on these devices. All right, let's jump into the next. Realistic looking fake Office 365 spam quarantine alerts on the rise. Now a new series of phishing attacks are using fake Office 365 notifications, asking the recipients to review blocked spam messages held in quarantine with the end goal of stealing their Microsoft credentials. The emails are a Microsoft.com address along with personalized subject headings to create a sense of urgency, kind of the classic technique of phishing. However, they still come with text formatting issues and out of place extra spaces that would allow spotting these emails malicious nature on closer inspection. So I would think that there'd be some kind of AI or grammar check on something like this to catch these spam emails. Why are something like this getting through, Paul? What do you think? Yeah. Hey, and and I've got a couple things on this, right? So, I mean, obviously we continue to have spam. Spam still continues to work uh, and, and we see attackers using it all the time. Uh, but there really should be something more in the way that we're managing email. Email is a very open standard. It's very easy to communicate. It's very easy to send an email as anyone with anything in it. And there's really... I don't know why today there's not more validation that we have on emails coming in, making sure that they're coming from the right person. Um, but by the way, why do we have so many organizations that you're capable of using the a, a scam like this to get credentials to work? Shouldn't shouldn't MFA be everywhere at this point right. and be causing these type of scams to really be very low in success rate? Excellent point. Tess. Text message service helped government track phones. Now, a report from Bloomberg and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism has found that the Swiss company Mido AG, which <coughs> provided automated text messaging services for businesses, also sold access to its network to surveillance technology companies to help locate devices. These companies were in turn used by government agencies. 
This service wasn't shared with the company's technology partners and was limited to a small group inside the company, Mido denies this report. Now, if this is true, this is perhaps a cautionary tale about keeping your close tabs on your suppliers. But what do you see this as doing to corporate relationships generally? If no one can trust anyone, or is that how we should be? I mean, there's got to be certain <laughs> levels of trust, but do we now heighten our trust issues or obviously build more zero trust architecture? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, look, I I, uh, I would preference that the whole world believes the way I do, which is don't trust anyone, right? Um, as, as a good security person it struggles with trust of anyone and and tr or trust but verify, right? Um, but yes, we should be having a very good third party review program. Lots of organizations struggle with their third party review programs, um, uh, but I think you know you've got to have vetting, you've got to have evaluation, you've got to review technical controls. And you really should have another layer or, or, or a better defense in depth strategy that allows you to be flagging when there's potential things happening in a third party that aren't expected. Um, and I, I'm, I, I think most organizations that we talk to struggle with that issue. By the way, we just got a comment on our uh, Microsoft story. Uh, people saying uh, people often push back against MFA or they cheat. And I don't know exactly how they cheat specifically, but MFA does not have wide adoption, right, Paul? It does not. Um, we, we do not see wide adoption. I see a lot of organizations talk to us and tell us that, hey, it's just too hard. We have people that refuse to right. use their own personal devices. I disagree. I've got a whole long perspective on that. Um, cheat might be referencing something along the lines of uh, you know, falsifying a uh, uh, text message. If you're using text mm -hmm. messaging for MFA, you could potentially cheat that. Um, but boy, does it make it a lot harder for these generic things. And hey, aren't we just trying to be a little more secure than our neighbor, right? And and then our yeah. company gets a little less picked on. And also the chat room also on this middle AG story said the, these companies require closer vigilance as they are the holders of the data. So if you're holding data, more vigilance. Next story, volume of attacks on IoT OT devices increasing. A new study from Microsoft has some depressing stats that shows that 44% of respondents interviewed said their organization experienced a cyber incident that involved an IoT or OT device in the past two years. Now, the other stats revealed that between a third and half of these companies do not have an inventory of their devices, and that most of these devices are directly connected to the internet. So, Paul, obvious question, should companies be legally obliged to perform audits on their IoT technologies? And I gotta assume there's gotta be some type of regulations here. Or should actually insurance companies step in to force this issue? Is this just free market economics or a national infrastructure issue? What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, IoT is a huge problem. I've actually spoken at a number of conferences about the risk that IoT presents, and it still continues to be ignored. Um, you know, IoT devices, they're running an operating system like anything else, and there are many organizations disregard them from making sure patches or firmware are updated. They put them on the same network segment as sensitive systems. Um, we see it in retail all the time, right? I mean, retail organizations are using, whether it's the, the music player, whether it's the digital sign, whatever it is, all these IoT devices are existent, and they're sitting on the same networks as we're processing credit card transactions, and it's it's a it's a significant risk. Um, That's yeah. an ugly mix. It is uh, for sure. And you know we should be pushing back. Whether we should make it illegal, you'll probably get a little my, my perspective on uh, making things a legal finding. Um, the market's going to drive it out, right? We're going to see organizations that choose to do the right thing because breaches continue to occur. Um, well, wherever breaches are, there's going to be new regulations. That's right. That's right. And now. Let's spend a few moments with our sponsor, Tynes. Now, Tynes is a no-code automation for security teams. Now, it's trusted by some of the world's best companies like Canva, Auth0, and Coinbase. And this holiday season, you could book a 10-minute demo of Tynes. No-code automation. I mean, we talk about no-code on our show, and we talk about automation, so this might be of interest of you. Book a 10-minute demo of Tynes, and they'll donate that's Tynes, $100 to your favorite charity. And they're certain that you'll love what you see. So head over to Tynes.com slash charity to book your 10-minute demo, and they will send $100 to your favorite cause, obviously, once you have that demo. Burnout can lead to security threats inside a risk. 
1Password has released the Burnout Breach Report, studying the rising burnout rates across all industries throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And the report found that more than 80% of professionals, by the way, I think it's probably higher, are feeling burned out, leading to serious backsliding related to security protocols. Yikes. Burned out employees are a third less likely to follow their company's security guidelines and are 60% more likely to create, download, or use software at work without IT's permission. Similar bad news around security professionals as well. So Paul, we already have a security skill shortage. It's tough enough getting people to be security aware. How do you fight this one? Yeah, I, I mean, look, um, burnout's going to happen. I think all of us have been working from home for a very long time. I'm a little surprised to read that security professionals are at the top of this risk criteria. I mean, most of us have been working you know, either remotely or on web, uh, you know, web and video conferences for a long time. And actually, a lot of security people that I meet uh, prefer the new the new model of work because they don't have to have that human interaction that, you know, some <laughs> somebody that enjoys the computer. Um, I'm not I'm not one of those. I, I like the human interaction. But look, I think we need to be managing our people, whether they're whether they're home, whether they're local. And we need to make sure that they're not checked out and staying engaged with our people is the best way to do that. Forcing your your team to be on camera, forcing your team to, uh, you know, if they won't, when times are not as scary, uh, even having just, you know, a day a month to get together in person or grab lunch with them individually in an outdoor setting, like something to keep burnout from being reduced or from being an impact. Um, yeah, by the way, I want to quote John Gallagher here. Uh, from Vaiku, he, he says, unremediated IoT vulnerabilities are heading us to tragic outcomes given the life safety critical functions many s such devices have. And I did actually see a headline for a story, I believe out of Vice, that we may have actually had our first true case of cybersecurity causing a loss of life, sadly. All right, IT execs uh, as likely to face the axe, or excuse me, or, or excuse me, IT execs half as likely to face the axe after breaches, shortages to blame, shortages meaning in staff. Now, senior IT and cybersecurity professionals are nearly half as likely now to be fired following a data breach today versus three years ago, according to new data from Kaspersky. Going down from 14%, how we're fired in 2018 to 7% today. Now, a second report from ISC Squared shows that 2.7 million security professionals are still needed worldwide meaning the workforce is still 65% below what it needs to be. I, Paul, I think a lot of different reasons for uh, for this, that, and I think it's just because more people are facing breaches. You just can't keep firing people because of it. And you talk to every security professional, they've all had incidents. So, and, you know, there is education happening in colleges, but what do you think companies could do to either justifying hiring more IT staff and what's your reasoning you think for the lowering and getting fired? Yeah. I, and I don't know that lower the, the redu reduction in getting fired is necessarily tied. I mean, I, I'd have to understand this study a bit more to truly mm -hmm. be able to understand the judgment call being made here, because what I have seen is security executives and IT executives in general are not being fired as frequently due to breaches because they're not being viewed as the source of the problem as frequently as they have in the past. I, I think, you I know, know what, but, but let me pause you there. Do you think just people are becoming more enlightened as a result? I, I think people are getting better at ignoring it. I, I don't I don't know. Um, you know, more enlightened, I guess, you know, that perspective would mean that uh, the rest of the organization is more understanding at this point of the fact that breaches are happening and maybe it's not the yeah, I th not the I IT think, person. I think that's what it is. But that's, go on. That's possible. I mean, I think that goes with what I was thinking on this is it really is it, it's not necessarily the fault and I think historically it didn't used to be the fault. It just used to be un misunderstood. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody needed to be the fall guy and pay the CIO in, in, in position or the CISO in position is the one that takes the hit. Um, but it's, you know, most of the time when I read the details of a breach, they've been brought up as issues to the organization if they are an ongoing issue or they're a targeted attack that wouldn't have been stopped anyway. Um, and, you know, these, the security guy may have found something as quickly as possible with the technology that they had to, to respond. A look at health data leaks in 2021. 
According to data submitted to the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services, over 40 million people in the U.S. had personal health information exposed through data breaches this year. The total number of breaches impacting 500 more people was down from 599 in 2020 to 578 in 2021. But the number of people impacted increased 53% on the year. So these seem like amazing numbers. What's your take on this, Paul? Yeah, these are huge numbers. Um, uh, you know, PHI is is a heavy target, and we're seeing with all of the healthcare information systems that are being put online and the interaction with third parties, um, a lot of the software technology companies that are that are servicing uh, these medical services organizations have forced a lot of this data interaction that's that's creating holes. And the investment that we see in medical organizations is not as nearly as high as it should be. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about IoT and, and life impact. Here, here's where the problems are coming in, right? I mean, the exact same reason that we're seeing healthcare records disappear is what's going to cause potential human life harm issues with IoT devices connected to people's hearts and, you know, breathing machines and whatever else may be going on in a hospital. And our last story, AWS as the Internet's biggest single point of failure. Now, an opinion piece in Vice describes how this week's AWS outage has shown the world just how much the internet relies on it. Not a surprise, but... And why, though, it's a bad thing? Because the piece highlights that access isn't the only concern, but the way in which AWS manages security for its customer sites means that features such as MFA and SMS verification systems could, well, disappear, as happened recently at Parler. So, Paul, this is an ironic discovery given what the internet was designed to be. I mean, you know, a network with no choke points. Is this something that Amazon actually has a responsibility to fix or would the markets just step in and, you know, take over what Amazon or essentially their top two competitors, Azure and Google Cloud? Yeah. I, I mean, the way I'm reading this, I'm not sure I understand why we would be blaming Amazon, right? Because they got so big that they became the go-to source for organizations. I mean, I, I want to push back on the organizations that are allowing it mm -hmm. to be a single point of failure, right? I mean, where, where's the where's well, the that's recovery? Why many organizations have multi-cloud, sure, for just or, this reason, or using cloud as your primary and using your data center as the backup now, right? Or whatever you may choose to do. But you know, the fact is, is if you didn't write a recovery time objective, a recovery point objective, a BCP plan, a DR plan, right? You've made an error in judgment, and those those documents or those processes should be able to help you understand: Do I need a redundant facility? Could I have a redundant facility with two Amazon facilities? Or do I need a backup with GCP? Um, you know, I, I blame the companies here more than I do Amazon. You know, and that's a really good point. And this came up in one of our video chats of you know determining risk. You just you have to have that conversation of what does an hour of downtime mean? What is two hours? What does a day of downtime mean? Like. At what point, like, at what point of downtime does the company cease to exist? Let's make sure we're at least at that point and then work, you know, work our way. And Sure. You know. And what's the cost of that downtime? So if an hour of downtime costs you $14 million and it costs you a million dollars to build a redundant facility and there's a, you know, 5% chance of it happening, well, we just did the mathematical equation to decide how much right. you should be investing. Good point. All right. Now, Paul, any thumbs up or eye roller stories here of the eight stories we went through? Um, you know, it's interesting. I um, I think IoT is is my is my thumbs up, or maybe I'll call it my eye roller. And you know, because it's, I'll give it both. <laughs> and and the reason for <laughs> okay. that is, uh, it just frustrates me that we continue to see IoT devices in so many organizations. We see the growth of it, and I love what IoT brings to the market. I love what you can do from an automation perspective with existing technology that wasn't automated in the past. But the fact that we're allowing it on our networks and we're not even thinking about keeping it patched and maintained, and we're allowing third-party access into these devices without even thinking about the potential of pivoting from it to our other systems is baffling to me. Extremely good point. Uh, Paul, where can people find you? What would be the best way to contact you? Uh, you can reach me, uh, you know, via, you know, LinkedIn is probably the best uh, format. And uh, my LinkedIn email or LinkedIn contact right there, is there below. Right on the screen, LinkedIn in at WP Truitt, T-R-U-I-T-T. -T. Awesome. Well, uh, that's Paul Truitt, who is the principal over at Mazars. And I want to thank uh, our sponsor, Tynes, the no-code automation for security teams. Make sure you go to tynes.io slash 
um, charity and book your demo with them. You can also come on back we the back next week for our Friday video chat, which will be our last of the year, Hacking Virtualization, an hour of critical thinking about how virtualization can simplify your security architecture. It starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, followed by a meetup. And then an hour after that, we'll be back with another edition of the Week in Review on Friday, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 Eastern. It is going to be the last week of review and the last video chat for 2021. Remember, we do the cybersecurity headlines every day. It's just six minutes of the news, so subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you don't know this, you can actually subscribe to the newsletter and get it in your email as well. All the details available at CISOseries.com. I'm David Spark. Enjoy the rest of your week. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.